Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Facing the Tough Questions, Maintaining an Open Dialogue on Social Media. We still have a few attendees that are logging on, so we're going to give them another moment or two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Our featured speaker today is Austin Ellington, the Digital Communications Coordinator for Round Rock, Texas, and he will be guiding us through facing the tough questions and maintaining an open dialogue on social media. This speech is part of our Agency to Agency webinar series, and we'd like to welcome everyone in joining the best and brightest in social media for local governments and school districts and learning best practices and how to get the most out of your social media. A little housekeeping before we begin. All attendees are on mute, but you have a device to the right of your screen. You can use that to suggest any questions. There will be time for a full Q&A following both presentations. We will be following up by an email with resources from today's webinar within 48 hours. A little bit about today's webinar. We will be starting with Austin Ellington as he leads us through his experiences at Round Rock, Texas. Following, we will have Alex Bowman and she will be discussing some of her experiences in the legal and policy issues dealing with record keeping in social media. And my name is Jessica Parker, and I will be helping throughout this process. A little bit more about our speaker, Austin Ellington. Austin Ellington is the Digital Communications Coordinator at the City of Round Rock, laser focused on creating compelling content and developing strategies to not only reach, but also effectively engage with the public. He considers himself to be a part-time public information officer, blogger, photographer, community, community engagement specialist, and sometimes government social media geek. Oh wait, that one's full time. Prior to joining the city of Round Rock, he held communications and marketing related positions with the University of Texas system, the city of Austin, and the Texas House of Representatives. He recently served as a council member for the government social media organization and regularly speaks as a thought leader on government social media strategy and at state and national conferences. Welcome Austin. All right, um, so I'm Austin Ellington. Hopefully everybody can see my screen at this point. Um, archive social guys, everything look. Uh, not quite yet. Did you get a pop-up? Yes. Hold on. All right. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna talk on uh, government gone social, uh, engaging to enhance transparency and strengthen credibility. Again, I'm Austin Ellington, the Digital Communications Coordinator for the City of Round Rock. Um, and hopefully today we'll be able to take away some uh, good information on how we can make our organizations more transparent using social media and also enhance um, the credibility of our organizations in the public uh, through the public eye. Um, so one of the main things here um, that I'm gonna discuss if I can get this to actually advance. Okay, um, is really when we talk about, when we have presentations like this, in general, there's some type of issue we're trying to solve, right? Um, I think one of the main issues we face with government communications or just public sector communications in general is that sometimes there can be an issue, an issue with trust. This um, slide here is really, obviously, it's not a, not a political statement, although there are political names on here. It's really just an emphasis on, um, and this is related to national politics, but I think when we look at things like this, we can see a trickle down among public organizations in general, how people perceive our organizations or how, um, how credible we're viewed to be, how much trust people place in our organization and just how they, how they feel about um, organizations in general, local governments are obviously 
uh, this chart is significantly different for a local government than it is for the national scale, but it's good, just a good uh, look at, you know, how people are viewing uh, politics and government in general and how um, that can potentially impact us as uh, government agencies. So um, unfortunately, sometimes the perception of government agencies can be um, that we have you know, I've heard the term lazy bureaucrat or that, you know, people have a perception that as organizations, we're slow, we can be slow, slow moving, um, not always on the top of adopting technologies. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the, the second bullet here, I think is super unfortunate in terms of uh, people viewing us as self-serving rather than dedicated to providing for the, for the people. And from a communication standpoint, um, starting off with this diminished credibility is you know extremely difficult right we're having to go back and overcome um preconceived notions that people have about what we do as organizations and, and most everybody i'm sure everybody on the call or on the webinar right now um has a completely different view of that right we spend every day working with individuals who are extremely passionate um about what they do for for a job um hopefully at least uh, and and we know the work that we do whether it's a school district or a local government a city um that we're truly doing things that impact people's lives in a positive manner uh, and so having those other types of views out there makes it extremely difficult from a communication standpoint uh we we already have something very large to overcome right uh but on the same side of that token um just as public organizations we we have this higher level of accountability right people the, the way that we fund our projects is through uh utilizing people's tax dollars through grant funds through uh funding mechanisms that are paid for by by the public by our constituents uh, and so rightfully so we're held to a to a higher standard of what we do as organizations and we have to um, stand up for the, the decisions that we make at a different level than if somebody went out and bought a product, um, they had a choice to buy that product, right? Um, not when somebody moves to our community, yeah, they had a choice to come to our community or they had a choice to move somewhere and attend a certain school district or whatever that case may be, but the services we're providing, they didn't necessarily have a choice, right? They didn't maybe didn't have a choice on who's providing their water or who's maintaining the streets. Those are just things that we as public organizations do um, without somebody having a choice to go somewhere else and get a service provided somewhere else. So um, a higher level of accountability there is definitely understandable. Um, and based on that, really, our agencies are under constant scrutiny, right? We're doing things that are impacting people on a daily basis. Every time they drive to work, the work that a local government does or a city municipality does is impacting them. If traffic's bad, potentially that's something that we have. If, you know, if a street's not well maintained, um, safety of communities is oftentimes in our hands, uh, just a variety of different things that really impact people on a personal level um, and, and the fam their families. So it related to all those different types of decisions that we make and the projects that we work on in the public sphere, um, it's my belief and I feel like really should be everybody on this webinar's belief uh, is that the public really deserves to be informed they deserve to be heard and they deserve to be responded to in terms of uh, the types of decisions that we're making, right? We should be able to provide background information on, on the different projects that we're working on. If somebody has a question, we should be responding to that. Um, that higher level of accountability, I feel, is rightfully placed and it's something that we should take as an opportunity as organizations in the public sphere to help combat those that first slide where, where we have are able to see kind of low levels of trust in government, we have the opportunity to utilize social media channels specifically um, as a mechanism to help combat some of that and really enhance the credibility of our organizations um, through some of the work that we do on these platforms. So um, over the course of time, right, we've all been, there's plenty of ways we interact with the public. Um, we have public meetings. Uh, we take phone calls from people, whether that's somebody in utility building or a 311 phone call operator or whatever it is. Um, and we answer emails, all three of those different things, you know, that's just three examples, but we're we're all familiar and comfortable 
uh, placing ourselves out there and answering people's questions and, and engaging with people on those mediums, right? It's just kind of an expected thing. If somebody sends us an email, we respond as an organization. If somebody attends a meeting, we don't just walk away if they walk up to us and ask us a question. Um, and if somebody uh, rings our phone in our office, we don't just ignore it. Hopefully, I, I assume most of us don't ignore f those phone calls. Um, we actually pick up the phone and have a conversation with people. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times on social media, that, that's not always the same case, right? Um, sometimes these platforms are seen as scary places where people interact um, and have conversations about our organizations. Um, sometimes leadership can be apprehensive to um, being involved in this sphere and, and being an engaged participant because people could potentially have something negative to say about our organization. Um, so we're not always in the should I respond or shouldn't I respond. Um, sometimes that ends up being the case on these social platforms uh, when really people are out there having the conversations regardless uh, whether they're negative or positive and we're out there on we've put ourselves out there for the most part on these platforms um, to have an active presence unfortunately that's not always the case in terms of engagement um, so I think one of the main takeaways here from this presentation and obviously there's going to be a, a good number of pieces of information that are discussed but um, short and simple is that social media is meant to be social uh, we are out there on these platforms in a space that we don't own uh, and we should be utilizing them to their full potential in order to help our organizations uh, not just push information but actually engage with people create relationships um, the platforms weren't created to be mechanisms for robotic information sharing uh, they're meant to in emphasize two-way communications right they're meant to for us to be able to have a conversation with people they're really were meant for people just community people out initially like college students right talking back and forth sharing information that way migrating over to to now just people in general uh having conversations with people if you look at things that mark zuckerberg and other people that are uh managers of the platform uh, managers of the platforms that are out there related to social media, they're they're all talking about creating relationships. They're all talking about coming together and building communities. Um, just pushing information is not building a community. It's uh, all about the conversations and the engagements that we can have with people. Uh, and it truly, on a level of uh, benefiting our organizations, comes down to um, these are things that we should be doing and they're really truly in the event that we take them seriously and, and go full in and, and truly go out there and engage with our constituents and our community have the ability to enhance what we do and enhance the credibility and uh, overall trust people have in our organizations and the work we do on a, re on a regular basis. Um, so sometimes I think we fall into this one-sided view or short-sighted view that um, we offer opportunities for engagement right we hold public meetings we have open houses on transportation projects we offer ways for people to come in person and have a communication with us you know they can have a conversation with the department director oftentimes at, at something like this they can have communications with the people um, that are actually doing the work which is great and that's still a, a super important part of the processes that we have in terms of community engagement. It's always going to be a place that's great for people to speak directly to leadership and those types of things. Unfortunately, um, a meeting once every two weeks or once every month or once every week on a weekday during the week at night um, doesn't allow for people to have real lives, unfortunately. Um, and, the, and the case, of, I mean, the reality is that people have plenty of things going on in their life that impact whether they can attend a meeting and give us their feedback um, on important things that are impacting their lives that we're, that we're dealing with and, and that we're utilizing their funds. I promise this is not my kitchen, um, but these are, actually, these are actually my kids. Um, and so I empathize completely. I have twins that have like, I don't know what that green stuff is, but they do all kinds of crazy things and they end up in, in cupboards and like falling over the side of a chair. And so I empathize with people that um, can't necessarily make make a meeting in order to provide feedback and I also empathize with the government side of things that says you know when we open ourselves up to communication and engagement and conversation on social media we end up with a lot of questions right um, because people I think 
sometimes we go into thing, this type of sphere and, and think that because we're not uh, <clears throat> getting all the engagement that we otherwise would see that people just don't care or they're not coming to the meet, people don't show up at a meeting, so they must not care about what we're doing. Um, I think the exact opposite is true. I think people truly, really do have a desire to be engaged and active in public communication uh, communication with their public agencies. Um, unfortunately, they just can't do it in some of the old, older fashioned mechanisms all the time. Uh, maybe they could make, make one meeting over the course of several months um, if they were truly a super engaged member of the public that wasn't dealing with all the other things but also they have the ability to reach out to us 24 out you know 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days of the year because we're on these social media platforms we may not be able to respond every, every minute of every day throughout the night uh, obviously but we are able to uh, have a presence and be engaged and show them that we're there uh, and having responses to the questions that we're asking us. So you can see in the chart, this is uh, City of Round Rock, uh, just the Facebook page over the course of like a three-year period. Um, you can see growth there. So obviously, um, there's a desire for people to continue asking us questions, to continuing engaging with their local government, um, which I think is an awesome thing uh, from from a standpoint of someone who works in, in government, not just in from the communication side of things, right, but just from an overall organizational standpoint for people to to want to have more knowledge about the things that we're doing, for people to want to ask questions, for people even for people to ask tough questions. I think that's good for um, the work that we do to have people truly um, interested in the things that we're doing because that's going to lead also to an overall increase in, in the uh, trust that people have in us in the end. Um, so, but overall you can kind of see a growth, but even back in 2016, 2017 people, I mean, 14,000 uh, engagements. That's so this is really comments and direct messages. So almost 20,000 times over the course of a year, someone reached out to us to get more information or to have feedback or to provide some type of engagement with their local city government. And that to me is like a, it's a crazy win for local government and government organizations in general, uh, for people to have that type of desire to want to interact with us um, in the first place. <clears throat> so when you have that type of engagement though obviously like it's not all going to be you guys rock and city of round rock is awesome although we do um get a lot of that we also deal with a lot of tough questions and we deal with some controversial topics right uh, that are impacting people's daily lives um <clears throat> what i think is the benefit here or the opportunities is that when we actually respond to these people that may have tough questions or they're providing feedback that may be um not directly positive to our organization, even from the standpoint of hearing and responding to someone, even if they don't agree with the, the response that we have, is providing that opportunity, that person an opportunity to feel heard, right? That's a lot of what we want if we're out in the sphere and something happened on a flight and we provided feedback to Southwest Airlines or whoever it was, just to hear that they heard what we said is, I mean, you're winning at the beginning of that. Um, it's providing you that opportunity to immediately like de-escalate something. If I worked in a call center, right, I would there, go through a protocol of like somebody called up and they were angry about a situation there. We would try to de-escalate and try to bring them down from whatever um, issue that they had so that we would be able to explain better um, some of the, the pieces behind that. So it's just providing us an opportunity to inform also uh, and not just for that one specific individual, right? We deal with, um, in the social media sphere, you know, a comment thread that may be a hundred comments. Um, and so I may be responding specifically to one individual, but the, the reason behind that is not just for that one individual, although um, that's absolutely like part of it. Um, we want to respond to that individual, for that individual to be heard and for them to potentially learn more about what we're doing. But also there's thousands of people clicking through the comments. So we, we're responding for that person and we're also responding for the general population to, to receive more information about what we're doing, for us to have feedback back to that person, for us to defend our organization, for us to be able to um, provide that level of response that as a public government organization, we should be uh, having. Um, and, the third bullet there, I kind of touched on it a little bit, but I think it's important <clears throat> as organizations that are held to this higher standard, to this higher level of accountability for us to be able to explain 
uh, the decision making behind some of the the decision, some of the projects and some of the decisions that we make, right? Like I've mentioned throughout the presentation, um, the things that we do on a daily basis are directly impacting people's lives. So if we're not able to defend the decisions that we make on a regular basis, um, that doesn't lend itself very well to the credibility of our organization. And sure, we can defend ourselves in multiple different places, but if you're not defending yourself where somebody came and provided the feedback, I think you're missing an opportunity. Um, and so last piece here really is that um, as communicators and as people that are dealing with these platforms, um, we're tasked with protecting our agency's brand and the reputation of our organization, right? Uh, every day, when we post things out in the sphere, the way we look, the way we act, the way we engage, if we choose not to respond to somebody, all of that is a reflection of our organization um, from the standpoint of, you know, are we an organization that is responsive? Are we an organization that is um, willing to have a conversation with somebody, even if it's about a tough topic? Uh, to me, I would absolutely want my city government to be to feel uh, comfortable defending what they do and having a conversation with somebody to, to show them or, or to, to let them know uh, why decisions were made or why something is the way that it is, even if in the end of that conversation we don't come to the same agreement, right? Somebody's going to feel at least like they were heard and at least like there was some opportunity to have a conversation and, and to gain more information. Um, so just to give you a little bit of uh, insight into <clears throat> some of the conversations that we have here at the city of Round Rock that I'm involved in directly, um, we respond to a variety of different things. Um, a lot of it positive, a lot of it positive, some, a good number of tough questions. Uh, ben here, he says, oh, we see that the taxes, we see what the taxes buy, we just don't want or use want or use what you're listing just because you want it doesn't mean the rest of the world should want it too um okay obviously when i got that you know i i took a couple of seconds to figure out exactly uh how we should respond to that um the, from the standpoint of the city of round rock and how we engage on social media we're direct i uh, definitely don't back away from uh, being able to respond and tell people defend what we do as an organization. So um, I won't read through the response there, but if you do, you can see that it's clearly like, it is direct, we provide more information. We're not afraid to show, I mean, to tell someone that we believe in what we do on a regular basis. Um, and I think truly um, that's a clear direct comment that provides the opportunity for someone to go learn more. And I don't measure success by how many people choose to like the responses that we have but it's a nice feeling to end something like that uh, with a potential negative comment on top and our response and have the, I don't know the number of people that actually clicked through and read our response, but to have seven, seven people um, come on there and feel the need to actually communicate that they appreciated their response to me is um, a great win for an organization when you're talking about um, defending what you do. Um, and what you offer as an organization. This initial comment here was related to um, our city budget and uh, proposed tax rate. So obviously a potentially contentious issue to begin with, uh, but um, feeling the ability to having the presence to go out and actually respond to that individual and provide more information about what we do, I think is um, an important takeaway. So um, Gretchen here, Apparently, we hadn't driven down her neighborhood street when we were doing street maintenance. Otherwise, we would have known that it was in poor shape. Um, we had a, a response since the inception of the city of Round Rock's neighborhood street maintenance program in 2012. Over $25 million has been spent to improve the roads in over 20 neighborhoods across the community. Plan to keep it going. Here's more information. Um, we don't just kick people off and say, thanks for the feedback, go to this website for more information. We provide the information directly on social media because that's where the person engaged with us. Um, she came back and didn't, she didn't say, Round Rock is awesome, thanks. But she did come back with a little uh, lower tone and um, appreciated in some uh, point that at least, it, I mean, it was a step in the right direction what we were doing. And I think in general, that's a, that's a win also. Um, to give, 
you a good feel for exactly what we deal with on a regular basis, and I'm sure you guys deal with it too. Uh, but we have a variety of different types of responses that we provide. Some are short and sweet, some are more detailed. Um, and so this resident has a question here about why the city purchased land to be only to be repaid by a multi-million dollar corporation. So clearly we get like difficult questions. This is me probably on like a Saturday morning answering a question about uh, a city being repaid by a multi-million dollar corporation. Um, but we respond to that also. And sometimes it's not short and sweet. Sometimes it's very detailed because the question that people, the question that the individual asked was kind of a, uh, complicated. I mean, the, the answer to it was complicated, right? There's a lot that go into the projects that we do. Um, and we put it all out there on social media because um, we wanted that person to have the information and we wanted everybody else that was reading through the comments about this potentially controversial project to have that information as well. Um, the good thing about this is uh, in the end, the resident response was, that is the first time I've had someone take the time to explain something like this to me on social media. To me, that is ex extremely meaningful. Um, they appreciated the fact that someone took the time to hear them. Someone took the time to respond. Someone took the time to actually respond with like meaningful, relevant information, which absolutely does not always happen on a regular basis in, in the social media sphere. There's plenty of times um, when I've interacted with uh, a company or someone else where I get just the generic response, thank you for your feedback, uh, we'll pass that along. Uh, and sometimes we have to provide that type of response, but on the norm, I think we should really strive to provide meaningful responses and truly engage the public because, um, again, I think it's it's what they deserve as, as active participants in our community. Um, and so, on a real regular basis, we have conversations like this, very long threads of people having engaging conversations with local government. Um, to me, if we could see this across government, you know, that, that trend line of decreasing trust would absolutely be going the other way because we're able to, just having the interaction with someone on a regular basis is about creating these relationships. It's about having the engagement with people. If, when you first go on a date, and you don't know the person, you've you've come to it because there was some type of connection, right? Some Somebody moves to our community because they had some reason to do that, So, uh, but they don't really know who we are. Um, similarly, if you're going through a relationship with another person, uh, you don't know that person full and well from the very beginning. You get to know them over a period of time, um, and people get to know us on social media over a period of time because they've had the opportunity to engage with us on multiple different occasions on plenty of topics. We're never afraid to have a conversation about something. And I think that shows from a standpoint of a government organization that, that we have um, credible, transparent communications that make you feel comfortable living here and asking us a question. Um, and then in the end, makes you feel more comfortable with the decisions that we're making. Um, that you don't always have to question what we're doing. Um, and, and so we get a lot of tough questions, but we also get a lot of positive things where we're able to have fun conversations with people. Um, Chip and Joanna gifts are uh, commonplace as a, you know, parks and recreation and those types of things. It's not like something that we use on every occasion, but people truly appreciate when uh, an organization has is a person, right? We're people here. Um, and I think we showcase that on a regular basis with what we do and the communications that we put out uh, and showcasing just that there, there are people out here doing real jobs. There are people that have true passion for what they're doing in our organization for you and your family in our community. Um, and even if we're just posting a GIF and this person here clearly showcases that it was an opportunity for us to have a, a relationship building engagement with a member of our community and and it worked right the next time she comes across something uh related to city government she'll probably pay a little bit more attention than she might have in another uh sense so <clears throat> so based on all that right i'm talking a lot about like we should do this or this is something that uh is absolutely a place that we want to be engaging and having these types of conversations but <clears throat> A good question would probably be, um, how do I actually go about doing that? So <clears throat> to give you a few strategy insights into the strategies that we use um, and that I use on a regular basis, um, 
accuracy is always a top priority, but also so is timeliness, right? Um, we want to be have timely responses to people when we're having conversations on social media. Things move fast, right? Something comes across our feed and then it's gone. Um, we have a conversation and then that conversation's over two seconds later. Um, he, from our, the standpoint of our strategy, we really strive for same day responses at the very least. Um, when it's within regular business hours, in general, there's somebody responding within a couple of hours. Obviously, there are uh, a variety of reasons that this would differ, but I think the main takeaway here is for you and your organization to figure out what is realistic and then come up with um, something that you would like to see. How, what do you think is realistic and, and then try to stick to that time frame on a regular basis, uh, whether that's responding to someone within 24 hours or if it's on a weekend, making sure that, you know, 48 within the, the Monday after that somebody's responded to, um, we take things kind of to a different level and are really like generally available most of the time. Uh, but I think the important, like I said, the important thing is coming up with something that you feel is realistic and truly trying to stick to it um, and, and actually uh, continue the engagement with people, even if it's not right away. We do see benefits to um, more timely response uh, in terms of the engagements on posts and things like that. Uh, the more conversation that's generated uh, as the post is performing immediately out in the feed, the higher the reach is. The more people that are going to see that post uh, the more people, the more people that engage with the post, the more likely people are to see it in their feed because that's what the platform wants. Uh, they want people having conversations. So um, the other benefit of timely response is that prevents the opportunity for mob mentality to take over. So when somebody comments on social media and then the next guy's like, yeah, I agree with that guy. And then the next person's like, exactly what Tom said. I hate this place. Um, some of that kind of like feeds on itself and it almost is like a snowball effect. We want to kind of try to take that a little bit away, right? We want to be an organization that comes out and defends ourselves. We come out with a response. Um, we come out and engage and automatically like we've inserted ourselves into the conversation. We've kind of stopped some of uh, that potential. At least we're in a space where we can uh, provide information from our organizational standpoint and, and uh, clear up any misconceptions or those types of things. But we're also uh, in the business of customer service as public organizations. I think sometimes, unfortunately, we've that's forgotten, but I think it's one of the most important things that we do, right? We have customers out there every day um, showing them that we're active and engaged and that we're that customer service is key, a key component of what we do is super important. Um, and it's about at this point in time, you have the ability to kind of surprise and delight, right? Um, from the first slide, people don't always expect government entities to be fast moving or that will actually respond. Sometimes they expect us to not respond and that the comment feed or the comment threads are gonna be a space for them to openly have like a sounding board and no one's ever gonna say anything back to them. Well, we have the opportunity to change that and to, to actually engage and to have those conversations. Um, and so at the, the bottom here, too much process or too many cooks in the kitchens can make this difficult or even impossible. If there's a, if there is a process in place where getting a response out takes seven different people to approve something, then it's, I mean, you're never going to be able to have the type of engagement that we're talking about. You can absolutely be responsive, uh, but timely engagements uh, going to require some type of procedure in place where you trust the individual that's kind of at the helm to, to be able to have these conversations and to develop over time. Um, that trust is absolutely necessary, but that's just a key thing to keep in mind um, is trying to figure out if your organization isn't already kind of doing this, um, that that's something to keep in mind because there's just there's no way to have um, every response have to go through something and it may make this successful. So um, <clears throat> one big thing that we utilize obviously is social media inbox. There are tons of tools for this, um, including directly on the platforms themselves, but organization's absolutely key. We're talking about 20,000 engagements over the course of a year. I don't know what that breaks down onto a daily basis, but it's, it's a good number. So um, being organized and having the ability to see things in streams that makes things easy to access and so you don't lose people and things don't get responded to um, is essential. Um, uh, so it allows you, some of these platforms allow you to 
tag specific comments for follow-up, assign tasks to other members of the team. Um, you can see previous interactions with different constituents provides the ability to add notes about some specific individual. Um, you can include all the accounts. So for instance, managing the city of Round Rock, we deal with you know a variety of different accounts. There's accounts all across um, the city in different departments. We don't specifically deal with all those. There are teams broken out uh, among departments that have specific individuals, but they're all built into the same uh, platform. We, util we utilize Hootsuite specifically, but uh, um, like I said, there are plenty of other ones. Sprout Social is mentioned on here, but um, there's a bunch of different options to do something like this. And looking inside of um, something like this, this gives you an example of just show, showing how the feed is actually broken, broken down. This is specifically just direct messages, uh, but it's showing you on the right-hand side the ability to actually see the previous interactions with that individual so I can know what was talked about with that particular person previously and the types of responses that we provided to them to ensure that we're being consistent, to ensure that I know kind of the background on like, maybe this person's talked about this 10, 10 other times uh, and those things, those types of contextual pieces are extremely important when you're talking about engaging with people on a regular basis uh, because you want to ensure that the information that you're putting out is accurate and consistent. Um, so that's just one example. And this is in on the actual uh, Facebook platform itself, but you can turn on these instant replies. We don't have them set, but it gives a lot of organizations like police departments and those types of organizations at least the ability to set up some type of instant reply where somebody is seeing that you're seeing something even if you can't immediately respond um, and then I think so Facebook's actually integrated Instagram and other things into their actual native platform tool for messaging so you can see all that in kind of one single stream and respond there it's also included this other piece that uh, where you can tag things and add specific labels to um, p interactions and things like that. So um, it's getting more advanced actually in the native platform, but um, some of the other tools that out there that aggregate it all together are still extremely, extremely helpful in that. Um, <clears throat> sorry, getting a little bit like throat dryness. Um, the other main thing that we do, I think, that is extremely helpful is that we create FAQs for specific for specific topics and for specific uh, potentially contentious issues, especially contentious issues that we assume that people will have lots of questions about or some significant feedback on. Um, they can be project specific or more general to a topic. Um, they give someone like me who's responding to people on a regular basis somewhere to start. Um, they give other people on our team the ability if they need to step in they have the knowledge too um, it's just a good way to have something to start from some place to start versus someone asking me a question still sometimes this happens obviously where I don't have a, a background knowledge on a specific project or something that's out there but a lot of times we can and so we develop these um, FAQs as a way to kind of mitigate some of the necessary back end work that it would take in order for me to find the answer about something. So um, <clears throat> important to note here is that responses should absolutely still be tailored to the specific question or thought. Like just because I've created this list of uh, base responses to certain things doesn't mean I'm just going to copy and paste everyone out there and like hit it over and over to every time somebody responds. I'm still going to tailor and I'm still going to answer and I'm still going to use their name. Uh, and answer directly the types of the things that they're asking or the things that they say. These are just helpful pieces of information um, to really tailor a, a meaningful response. Um, <clears throat> and then the last bullet here is that um, since we're on a, I mean, one of the main ways that uh, we're able to develop some of these FAQs is that um, through the use of archiving tools, it allows us to go back through conversations um, and actually pull you know, I can type in um, a specific topic, I can type in economic development and find every conversation that we've ever had about economic development. I could type in Dell Computers, they're based here in Round Rock, and I could see every time we've had an interaction about Dell and what we said um, and what somebody else said. So it gives us that ability to kind of see what people have already asked about it and then develop um, FAQ surrounding those types of things. So on the left hand side here is a more uh, base use of like how we and this is just in te Microsoft Teams. It's like a place where we've placed um, some FAQs about variety of topics on um, throughout the city. 
<clears throat> that we can use utilize on social media. Um, and it's easily searchable. Um, it's just a nice way to put things in here. But like I said, so this is a more base type of example where um, it can really be just whatever. We have one of these for transportation. There's one on specific, uh, like we had the Public Safety Training Center, uh, specific projects like that, traffic in general, just what people ask about that topic in general and what our responses have been to certain questions related to that, uh, public transit, all those different types of things. But and the one on the right is obviously more laid out in a public sphere where we actually put this out in the public uh, on the website as a public FAQ. So there, I mean, the one on the left is obviously internal use only. The one on the right is uh, completely different from that aspect of already being public. But um, like I was mentioning, uh, pulling up archive social, you can go through a specific date range. We can look at specific accounts where we want to see what people's questions were. I can pull up. Um, all the different matches that are related to all these different terms or break things out if I don't want to include certain words. Uh, it just gives me the clear ability to kind of cultivate an FAQ that's truly meaningful to me on a, on a regular basis where I'm having to answer all these questions and being able to see what people have previously asked about specific topics. Um, <clears throat> the other big piece of this is cultivating an internal contact list, right? We want to have other people that can help me answer a question. Um, they need to understand that timely response is important. We want to have people on that team that, you know, where they understand that what we do is important and that timely response to that is also very important. Um, so going through and kind of figuring out who those people in are in each department, obviously as public information officers and uh, other people that are on this call, you already had kind of have some of that in place, but sometimes it's a team of people, right? Not always is the, CFO going to be available to answer a question, although in budget time, like she gave me her cell phone number so I could actually text questions and she understood the uh, necess what that what we did was important to that level where it was like, please, if you get a question that you don't know the answer to, I'm available to provide this type of feedback also. Uh, but letting these people know that when they're going to be on, if you know kind of that something contentious is coming, uh, kind of giving them a heads up. But this is a, an extremely important part because obviously I don't have all the answers um, and most likely you don't either. So um, and then just <clears throat> maintaining consistency in the response that we have. I touched on this a little bit. Uh, we're out there in the open responding to thousands of engagements on a regular basis. We want to make sure the information we are giving is accurate. So consistency is absolutely key here. Um, in terms of a variety of different things. So consistency of voice, right? We want to go with a direct yet respectful tone. So when I was talking about showing some of the examples, right? Uh, it was direct uh, and we definitely told the person kind of our side of the story, but at the same time, I'm not Wendy's here and sorry we have trains, but um, I'm not gonna go out and kind of blow somebody up and, you know, to that level of directness. So, um, but, Overall here, really, the ability, uh, consistency in terms of the information provided is the key uh, and the ability to recall previous conversations um, is extremely helpful. Again, uh, this is another place that we use, utilize an archiving tool um, just to be able to go back and see what this person has previously said, specifically if it's a contentious thing. Like a lot of times I'll remember um, that somebody had specifically talked about this previously. Scott is mentioned in here. I'm searching for him in relation to something because he asked over and over about the same thing. So especially when it's the same person, right? I want to be able to respond in the same way that I previously responded multiple times before because he knows, he remembers when I told him that that light was going to be uh, built outside his neighborhood. He remembers that I told him six months and if I come back and say 12 months the next time, he's going to be like, why? Why has the information changed and what changed and those types of things. So um, the extra benefit here is that even if somebody deletes their comment or uh, which often happens, this uh, individual said in a perfect world, something that should have been completed before Ikea went in. He's talking about a uh, road project over near where he is. Uh, eventually <clears throat> the comment was deleted probably mostly because um, we had a response to him and then he decided that his comment was no longer necessary. Uh, um, but we were still able to pull that up. And in the end, I'm still able to see that uh, months down the road if, if something comes up and I need that response. So 
the other <clears throat> almost closing out, but the other main thing that we do here is uh, we operate through kind of a campaign style of promoting things, which I think is extremely helpful in terms of enhancing the transparency of our organization. We don't just hide behind, I'm gonna post this once and hope nobody says anything to me. Um, we post things multiple times. Um, we utilize that campaign approach, uh, especially for contentious particular issues so that people are able to have multiple opportunities to see information and to receive information from us about a specific issue. Um, and it also gives them multiple times to have conversations with us. We want to have conversations with people. That's, and that's how we answer questions and that's how we provide our side of the story uh, on, on issues. So this is just a quick example overview of like the, some of the most recent ones that we've dealt with, but um, on the left, budget related stuff um, probably was a two, six to eight week campaign that included maybe like 10 posts, um, ended up with almost 400,000 impressions over the course of that, um, which was 400,000 times that somebody saw something about our budget and the local tax rate for a community of approximately 120,000 people. So. Um, obviously, we didn't reach the entire community, but numbers like that are great to showcase for uh, city council, other leadership, and show them what we're doing is truly effective and that it's impacting the uh, perception and brand of our organization. So, um, <clears throat> and then last but not least, I uh, saved this for the end because it um, is something, I mean, I think the other portions of this are extremely the most important conversation here, but uh, Blending organic and paid promotion is something that at this day and age on social media is it's pretty much like a necessity. Uh, organic, organic reach is not dead. There's still like, especially for our organizations, there's extreme potential to have uh, organic posts that reach thousands and thousands of people. On average, we probably see 10,000 uh, in terms of reach. That's kind of our average, but um, which is great for an organization on something like Facebook uh, when in general, you're seeing the algorithmic constraints kind of hold that in and not allow people to reach uh, organic numbers like that. But um, the ability for us <clears throat> to actually see reach beyond that, to, to reach beyond our page and be able to reach pr uh, almost everyone that's in our community on Facebook with a post that's extremely important uh, and be able to get that information out and potentially um, engage with those people. Um, the ability of paid to do that, paid social is um, a, a great tool in a toolbox um, and something that should absolutely be considered if you're not, um, because it's providing us the opportunity to, to really reach out and go beyond what we would otherwise be able to reach in terms of organizational uh, communication with the community. So sorry, I probably went a little bit over there. Hopefully we still have time for questions, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today. Thank you, Austin. Uh, a lot of fantastic information about the importance of having those conversations and ways to remain transparent for government and school districts. And to talk a little bit more about that, I'm going to hand it right over to Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I am going to be brief because we have had a lot of great questions and comments come in, and I want to make sure we have time to get to those. But I do want to talk briefly about what you can do to maintain that kind of trust and that transparency that Austin referenced on his slides. A couple things that he said that really stuck out to me is that, uh, you know, don't be afraid. Um, I think a lot of, I, I've been with Archive Social since 2014. I'm the director of customer experience. And so if something has happened on social media and government, I've seen it and I've helped people through it. So I, I understand that, that sentiment of don't be afraid because some things can happen. Um, but as Austin said, that you really your goal is you're building that trust, you're building that credibility, you're building that transparency because those things can be lacking on social media. And he also made the point that you as government agencies don't own those platforms, even though you're there using them. And it's really important that you understand how to use them in a way that keeps you protected and, and builds that trust. So we're going to talk very briefly about how you can cover your agency, your CYA. Uh, I want to start right off the top with making sure you understand that what it means for you to be uh, protected in your state. We, I'm putting this bitly up on the screen right now. This will, if you follow that, it'll take you to the specific record retention guidelines for your state. Every state in this country has some guidelines about retention of public records, as I'm sure you're aware. And if you visit this, this page, you'll find out what is specific to you. Um, 
if you want to discuss controversial topics and you're getting involved in controversy, you want to make sure you preserve the full story. So I want to tell you a little story about when this didn't happen. You may have seen this happen in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, a couple years ago. The mayor was posting and the topic was controversial and he received some negative commentary and didn't follow Austin's example of engaging with those citizens and, and tackling it head on and being polite and respectful, but instead took the approach of just deleting those comments. Um, people are watching. And what happened here is that people were watching and said, hey, you can't do that. You can't delete that. And the borough had a records request for the comments. And because they had just deleted them, they couldn't produce them and ended up with a lawsuit. And then because they hadn't saved those records, when the lawsuit came, there was no option there but to settle. So the real story here is that it, at the point in which you delete things from your social media and you just try to make them go away, you've now ended the conversation and put yourself into a position of you, you can't even defend your choice to do that. So whether or not your policy is to leave everything up or to hide things or to delete, delete things, you really need to make sure that you're preserving the full story so that if the question arises of why did you do this, you have the conversation there and you're, you can all talk about what existed and not just what maybe somebody said. Um, and again, that goes back to that, that trust and transparency. And they ended up paying $9,000 just to settle that lawsuit over a couple of deleted Facebook comments. Um, another story, and I want to give a positive example, because every time I say something that's a little bit scary, I want to give something that's a little bit good. This is a story from Evergreen School District in Washington, and who was looking for money for construction project to improve the district. They had a bond measure that they put out in the ballot for the vote, and the district used social media to educate the public about how the bond money would be used. They did a campaign similar to what Austin was talking about at the end there. They created 20 videos for social media, and put a ton of effort into having this discussion and bringing it to where people could access it and actually weigh in and comment. And what tends to happen, as it tends to happen when money's involved, there were some very vocal detractors that consistently posted on the district social media platforms because um, they didn't like this bond campaign. The local paper reported on the controversy, they issued a public records request for the social media posts and comments all related to that construction bond. And because the archive or the district had an archive, they were very easily able to search and produce the hundreds of posts and comments about the bond on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, share them with the newspaper, which saved them a lot of time and really helped them get control of their story and make sure the accurate information was out there for everyone to see. So this is a positive example about how being in control of those records and that story can really help you in your jobs when you're building that trust and credibility and you're trying to make sure that everybody's having the same conversation and not just talking to each other in, in the room. Um, so there is tons of good information in this webinar. And like I said, I wanna make sure that we get to the questions because there are some good questions we had before. Um, <clears throat> those of you who do have more in-depth questions about state public record laws, agencies and schools that are already archiving your area, but just like more information, you can reach out to us and we're happy to take this offline. We're actually going to launch a poll so you can, if you'd like to learn more that we didn't get a chance to cover today where I just touched on things very briefly and you want to speak about them more in depth, you can go ahead and click on this poll. I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. Um, just remember that if you do ask to speak with us, we're not going to give you a sales pitch. We just want to have discussion with you about your social media and ways you can stay safe and feel confident about having those controversial conversations. Thank you, Alex. That was really brilliant and really quickly. So uh, let's go ahead and while that poll is up, let's go ahead and jump into some of your amazing questions. So I'm going to start with one. Um, can you speak to the level of support you have from your mayor or PIO to speak at length on the behalf of your city? I'm going to guess this one goes to Austin. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I've had like a lifesaver now, though, so I think my throat's feeling slightly better uh, but yeah so um, here in Red Rock we're absolutely blessed with being able to you know we have a, a leadership team and city council and mayor that are fully on board with kind of the way we operate and um, it's allowed me to really like as an individual you know from the standpoint of my position here really dealing with social media on a regular basis I have kind of like 
the full reign and, and trust to be able to respond to individuals on a variety of different topics, pretty much anything somebody asks or any type of comment that they put out there. I don't necessarily have to go through anybody to get a response out. Um, and that's so much of why uh, time, why we're able to provide that timely response. And I think it's not something that happens overnight, right? You're not going to go out and say, hey, we're going to respond to everybody. What do you think? And that's a great idea, right? I don't have to get anything approved by anybody. Uh, but over time, you kind of build that trust internally. And we've been talking a lot about external trust, but I think uh, a lot of this is about building internal trust within your organization too, in terms of showing how responding to something can be beneficial, showing how you can create, craft a direct response that provides more information on a regular basis and how that can potentially be a positive for your organization. And so um, this didn't happen overnight. It's really like a process of us doing it and then sharing those results with uh, city council mayors. Uh, we have uh, our leadership teams active in like checking out social media. They don't always necessarily understand everything that's going on behind the scenes, um, which we all probably experience um, in our jobs. You know, not everybody understands what somebody else does for their job, but being able to um, show on a regular basis how, how we operate and how that process works and for them to be able to see the positives that come out of that over and over again is what really drives that trust and what really drives like the ability for city council and mayor and everybody to, to see, you know, he actually will walk by my office sometimes, which is a true testament to like the ability for a community to like Round Rock to be able to do this is, you know, gaining that kind of buy-in is absolutely necessary. So good question. Um, and it's really just a, a matter of like uh, a process over time of showcasing what you're doing and, and that type of thing. So hopefully that's gonna, uh, as a reminder, we're going to share this presentation with everyone who's attended today. And I'm going to suggest a great way to start that conversation is by sharing Austin's uh, Austin's presentation and, and opening that up to people in your leadership. And look what we can do. Look what we could be doing if we were to open ourselves up. See what Round Rock is doing. Um, excellent advice, uh, Austin. Related, we would like to have our social media by a means of two-way communication, but we just don't have the staff to monitor it, monitor it closely. And I know you touched on this briefly, Austin, but what are some other suggestions you might have for those small agencies that are currently just using social media as a bulletin board? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I think the main thing for to answer this type of question is uh, put yourself in places and focus on on what you can do, right? Like. I think when government initially went into social media, we all thought we had to be every place, every time, every, you know, every platform that was potentially out there. And every time something new comes up, we need to jump right on board so that we don't get left behind. Um, I think as a small team, um, you really have to dedicate where you can be and what you can do. I think it's absolutely more important to be uh, in a few places that you're really able to manage and like truly engage because like I said uh, throughout the presentation, I think that's the point of these platforms now, right? Uh, it's not to only push information. That is absolutely like a big part of our job, but I think figuring out ways where you can still uh, have this level, of, have some type of level of this type of engagement uh, by kind of managing the places that we're potentially putting emphasis. Um, so if that means then I'm not advocating for anybody to, to drop certain things off a list, but I just mean like uh, figuring out where the community is most active and where you're going to get the most bang for your buck and then placing some good em emphasis there um, so that you can truly have the conversation with people and, and make it a place that is active and engaged and, and meaningful for you and your community. Outside of that, I think the tools are extremely helpful just because you can assign things back and forth to people and there can be more of like a dual process of multiple people taking control of things, but um, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, I think it's really, like you said, it's it, don't try to do everything all at once and really think critically about which platform is going to work for what it is you're trying to do and and focus on that and do more go deeper on what better to go deeper on one platform than to go very thin across so many that there's just no point being there absolutely so we have time for about one more question 
chose a short one. What is a recommended duration of time for record retention on social media? Alex. Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. Um, I get this question a lot, and I think that the answer is always in your own state public records laws. Um, social media is, even though it's not new, we're already 15 years into it, it there are a lot of states that haven't actually, and municipalities that haven't tackled this question as fully as they can. And I think one piece of advice I would do is do speak with your clerk and your whoever manages your records, but also think of it more as the content and not the medium that you're dealing with. And so you may say, it doesn't matter if it's on Twitter, if it's about a bond and we are pu publishing information on municipal law, that's gonna have a longer retention schedule than say, just saying, hey, it's a nice day outside, folks. So, I mean, this is really a question for your on a local level and a state level and for your clerk. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Alex and Austin, for your time and insights and everybody who joined the webinar. We are right at the top of the hour, so we're going to close it today. I hope you can join us again and be watching out for your email for the follow-up resources from this webinar. Thank you so much. Have a great day.